is, is I become Apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. So I do what any author, good author does, is I become an expert within 24 hours on a specific topic. As I was going through the history of it, I kept coming across these stories of Ferdinand and how he would do things like rip wigs off of people because uh, he didn't like the wigs. And that was the fashion of the time was to wear a powdered wig and he didn't like it for some reason. He would play innkeeper, fishmonger. Uh, he was, he liked to play farm. He liked to play chess with the old men while they sat around by the sea. And I thought, oh my God, who is this man's poor wife? There had to be some woman who is married to him and had to put up with him. And it was like, I felt so bad for them. And that's when I came across Maria Carolina Charlotte and her story. And I was just so just taken in by it. It was just all encroaching. It was right at the, the beginning of 2020. So this was pre-pandemic as well. And I was maybe halfway through the biography and I was having a conversation with my agent and we we're talking about what my next book would be. And so I was like, you know, there's this story about this. There's this woman named Maria Carolina Charlotte. And I just started talking about her and how interesting she was. And my agent was like, that's the next book you need to write because that sounds really interesting to me as well. And then the pandemic hit. It was about, you know, in March, right? Mid-March. And that's when I was sitting down to write the book. And so in the midst of the pandemic and everything shutting down and the world shutting down, I was here in this room with my laptop creating Charlotte's world. And I like to refer to her as Charlotte because she's also Maria Carolina Charlotte. And she actually didn't like being called Maria Carolina. To her family and her friends, she was Charlotte. And that was something that was a personal thing. And she only liked to be called uh, Maria Carolina when it was a proper thing. Or at one point in the book, she got mad at somebody and she was like, no, 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 you lost the right to call me Charlotte. You're going to call me Maria Carolina <laughs> because she was petty and wonderful like that. And if I remember, an early draft of the book was did have Charlotte in the title, right? Yeah, when we when we sold it, it was I am Charlotte was the name. Initially. So Infinite's sister, um, I guess it's you know an obvious thing to help you know lead lead the readers to know mm -hmm. this major thing is you've never heard of Mar Queen Maria Carolina or the Queen of Naples, but everybody knows at least the name Marie Antoinette. Mm -hmm. And the two sisters were so close. And that was one of the things that they wanted to pull into it. So Maria Theresa, who was the Empress of Austria, she had 16 children, which is just so crazy for us to think about even in this day that there were 16 of them. And as you saw those pictures of Maria Carolina, they were, she was practically a twin to Marie Antoinette when they, they were three years apart and they were raised as twins. And so the girls were together all the time through their childhood. Probably, I want to say right up until about Charlotte turned like pre, almost preteen age when they started to get into trouble. And Maria Teresa was like, nope, you two need to be separated. You're causing way too much trouble and you're a really bad influence on your sister. And so, but even still, even in their later lives, they, were, they still look so much alike that after uh, Marie Antoinette's death, they were Friend, close friends of hers that actually went to Naples to be with uh, Charlotte. And there was one woman who had never met Charlotte before. And when she met her, she fainted because she looked so much like Marie Antoinette. Oh, wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. And so that sister relationship ended up being so important to me, at least within the story itself. And, you know, she's somebody that at least orients us in time. And, you know, it's worth saying that the Royal Palace at Caserta, as I mentioned before, it's the largest palace in the world, but it was also specifically meant to rival the palace mm -hmm. at Versailles. That was one of the, one of the directions was <laughs> bigger than that place. And so, they absolutely did. It's yeah. gorgeous. So in a sense, they were, I mean, in some ways competitors in that they were each the, you know, in charge of these, these kingdoms, of course, but at the same time, their mother was really consolidating power throughout Europe, right? Oh, absolutely. She was, it was kind of ingenious of her 
before she came along, her father had control of all of these duchies and regions. And the kingdom of the two Sicilies at one point was part of the Austrian empire. And then he lost it. The, there was so much back and forth with the histories. And that was one of the things within this story that I really had to kind of meld down because if I kept it going with all the different wars and everything going on, as a fiction book, it would lose readers. There'd be way too much information to keep a reader going. So I had to kind of, you know, bring it all down, but they were going back and forth. It was once her father's and he lost it. And Maria Teresa was just, and she thought that was the most terrible thing. He squandered away his rights to Europe. And so with all of these children, this was we think of Queen Victoria as being the mother of Europe, of having all of these children. That woman only had eight children. She had nothing on these women. And so with these children, um, Marie Theresa thought, okay, I have this resource that I can place at each of these palaces and they can work for me and be an influence for me. So she had um, a daughter in Parma. She had her sons, one in was in Milan. Another one was over there in Tuscany. Uh, then she had, uh, it was very important to have Maria Carolina in, in uh, the two Sicilies to the point where there were two other sisters that were supposed to marry Ferdinand. And they were, uh, there was uh, Maria Johanna and Maria Josepha. And Maria Johanna, she died of smallpox. She got the inoculation, but she died. And then you had um, Josepha who didn't get the inoculation and then she died. And hers was kind of mysterious where they say she died because um, Maria Teresa insisted after her proxy wedding that she go, they all go to the crypt and she say goodbye to her fa the family. And so when she did, she kissed a coffin or, or not necessarily a coffin. It was one of the, oh, it's her sarcophaguses. Mm -hmm. And she kissed it. And what they thought That's was when she kissed the sarcophagus, there was still some of the virus either attached to it or is open partially. And that's how she got it is what they believe at what? the time. So it was this very mysterious thing. So after these two sisters dies, these two sisters die, it was Maria Carolina's job to go in and be a part of this new kingdom. Now, the kingdom of the two Sicilies, you know, for those that were unfamiliar with it, and it is, it is complicated even if you are familiar with it, was controlled by mostly by the Spanish, but the French and the Austrians at different periods of time. Um, and then with a heavy, heavy French influence that comes later, first you have the Angevin French, then you, you have another faction. So it does get complicated, but this is also to say that Southern Italy today remains much more hospitable to outsiders than any other place in Italy because mm -hmm. of the history of foreign influence and of constantly integrating new cultures and new traditions. Um, you go to a place like Florence, and I absolutely adore Florence, but even today people are rather closed off. And they will tell you because it's the same people here that have been here since the Renaissance, and they're not very hospitable to change. And I always say the best thing about a person is the worst thing about a person. Best thing about a city is the worst thing about a city. And <laughs> certainly the fact that, that Naples is, um, you know, always been wide open. You don't hear that. It's like there's Armageddon breaking out outside of the streets of New York City, which I don't know if I just notice it when I'm doing Zoom presentations and it's always <laughs> happening or it's, it seems to be particular. Thank you. So just close the window. Anyway, I'm sorry to get distracted. But yes, Southern Italy is such an international place and as a, as a place for control with Maria Teresa thinking about how to consolidate power. I mean, it has so many ports. It has this, the capital cities, which are very, very sophisticated in Naples and Palermo, where goods from all over the Mediterranean are going back and forth. It's a very wealthy kingdom. There's a large gold treasury that lasted until the unification of Italy in 1861. So this was a really important place to have control over. Um, to, talk, to talk about some of those foreign influences, the we, we were chatting a little bit about them before. My, my favorite foreign influence that Maria Caroline brought in is coffee. So maybe you could start with that and tell us about some of the other international things that Maria Carolina brought. 
And then to go back to the point that you were talking about the consolidation of power, Maria Theresa called the Italian states her Italian colonies. Those were hers, even though they were their own countries by right, they were hers. That's what she thought of them. And so, yeah, the foreign influence, uh, the coffee thing. So we think of, whenever we think of Italy, we think of coffee. That's like natural. Like I started drinking coffee when I was in Naples as a teenager. That was my first introduction to coffee because I was not allowed coffee before that. And, and lots of, you know, Italians like to like look down on Naples for everything. But the one thing they'll all say is like, they've got the best coffee, they got the best pizza. We're not arguing there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly and it was so funny because when I was there with a bunch of Americans at the time they kept giving me I drank my coffee and I was like oh this is great and then they keep giving me more and more and more and I by the time I came back I was very addicted to very strong coffee and so for it was really interesting for me because I discovered with Maria Carolina that coffee wasn't a thing in Naples at the time it was they thought of it as being um bad luck or malachio because it, it was too bitter for them and but she was from vienna and vienna had a long tradition of, of coffee and she really liked coffee and she brought it with her to naples it was she was very insistent on that and there's an amazing there was and it even still is an amazing cafe culture there's a cafe right in the center of Naples that, that wouldn't have been around at this time, but it's certainly an outgrowth of the royals in Naples called the Cafe Gumbrinus. And it's kind of like right where all the tour buses drop off, usually for people to use the restrooms. <laughs> but <laughs> it is a beautiful um, early 1900s cafe in, in sort of the tradition of you know beautiful china and lovely pastries to go along with it. And it is very much a descendant of the influence from this time. I love it. It's uh, and it's it's wonderful. And in the book, I actually kind of I joke around about it, about her bringing in because and her having like it was almost like this throw line way line that I put in the book where the servants kept bringing her the coffee, but they would put like a what she thought was a pepper underneath the coffee cup because they they wanted to ward off the bad luck for her because they were still not used to it. And then over time, they uh, everybody started to get used to it. And it became the fashion. Because at that time, what was fashionable for the king and queen became fashionable for the court. And she was such an influence on music. The, the, uh, the theater that's there that you mentioned, that's where she was married. The chapel wasn't actually built. She had such a huge hand in the building of Caserta. So much of that palace is her. When I started going through the, the research on it and the time periods. And so that so she was married in that theater, and Vienna would had a lot of musicians come through. And one such musician that was so popular um, there was Mozart. And so he would actually come to Naples and visit Naples. He spent, I want to say a good six weeks. He did this whole tour through Italy. And he stayed in uh, Naples for six weeks. And he stayed there with um, Maria Carolina because they were childhood friends. They actually would run around the palace together because he was this child prodigy. And he became a playmate of hers and Marie Antoinette. And so him and his sister, they would play together. And he actually swore that he was going to marry Marie Antoinette one day. Yeah, well, and <laughs> Maria, Maria Teresa patted him on the head. She's like, oh, that's so cute. But no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they kept that friendship alive. And so she brought a lot of that, a lot of the art, a lot of the music and culture that you see in Naples is really her. The Mozart's opera for opera buffs, Cosi Fan Tutti, takes place on the Bay of Naples. Mm -hmm. And if, if you've heard me ever talk about this topic before, I'm going to repeat something I've said many times. If you have the opportunity to go see an opera in Naples at the Teatro San Carlo, you should go. Make sure you see an Italian opera because the real magic of it is not the performance, but that everybody sings along. And mm -hmm. there you really understand our opera as part of the, the common culture instead of like this highfalutin thing, <laughs> the really <laughs> inaccessible thing. Um, because at the time, you know, the language and the, and the way of singing, which sounds so strange and exaggerated to us today, was pop music. Mm -hmm. That's, I and mean, they, they were the rock stars. They, they were, were the rock stars. stars, exactly. Yeah, he couldn't, and what was interesting was that he couldn't really make it in 
Paris. Paris was the place to go for their theater. And he went there once and he failed. And it took him a while to go back there. So the door was always open for him in Naples. Well, Naples has always been famous for have, for known at a good time. The Romans used to actually go leave Rome, the capital city of Rome, to go down to the Vesuvius coast to, you know, near Pompeii. And they have all these beautiful villas along the Vesuvius coast specifically to have fun. It was like their Miami beach. It was like mm -hmm. where there was also a culture at that time of music from the Greeks that was left behind. So there's, there's a long history of appreciation for music and dancing in Naples. <laughs> um, of, of Naples, Ferdinand, her husband, is, is still a famous figure in Naples today. There's a, a beautiful church right across the street from that cafe I mentioned called San Ferdinando. And he is a fascinating guy, as you mentioned, when we got started. Um, because he was, his nickname was uh, Re Lazzarone, the Beggar King, because he really had just no interest in being an adult whatsoever, right? <laughs> I mean, he was famous and he loved Naples. He was a creature of Naples. His father, Carlo Charles III, actually was raised in Naples, was the king, very beloved, then abdicates to return to his native Spain and become the king of Spain leaving young Ferdinand, who's a boy, in charge with a regent, which is basically like the guy who's not, you know, genetically in control of the line, but is essentially administratively in control of the line named Tanucci, who encouraged young Ferdinand to be the worst person he could possibly be, which is not studying, not being serious, going fishing, uh, eating spaghetti with his hands in the box seat at the opera. <laughs> And so when Maria Carolina comes into the scene, she's got to be the boss, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, she, and not only that, she had to push Tanucci out. So this was a huge feat. So when she married Ferdinand, she was 16 years old and he was 18. So the age difference wasn't so bad because you the age difference historically for so many people is ridiculous. So there's a nice age gap between them. It wasn't too bad. And... So when she comes in, Tanucci's running everything. They had this belief that to ward off mental illness, you had to be outside and exercising. That was their main belief. The eldest son, I can't, I'm forgetting his name. I want to say, was it Philip? I think was the eldest. Yeah, it was Philip because it was Philip who had, he had a lot, he had something, there was something wrong. And unfortunately, because of the way that they looked at mental health, and any kind of mental health deformity, they kind of had them categorized by shades of whether you're an idiot, um, adult, what have you, is what they would refer to people. And so historically, they only refer to him as an idiot, which is terrible. Yeah. And so Carlos wouldn't actually bring him out. They kept him hidden away. And then it was the next in line, there was a Car uh, the Carlos II, and then it was... Ferdinand the third, who was third in line to be a king. So Carlos went to, goes over to Spain and Ferdinand stays in, in uh, Italy. And so Tanucci was like, all right, you want him to be active and outdoors? We're gonna make sure he's outdoors and I'll just run everything. And when Car Maria Carolina comes in, he's running everything. There is just rampant corruption. There's stuff that's just not getting done. And that was something else within the story that was just so hard to try to put together because there's so much corruption going on that you have to kind of streamline it for the average reader. And that's why I love to point to historians like, okay, here's where, you know, you want to know more. You want to know more about this corruption. You want to know what's going on. Here's the, the resources and the history to look at because this is what I looked at too to shape the story. And so that had so much that she had to deal with. And then there was one character who, it was kind of funny and interesting. He was the, um, he was the head of the military, but he was, um, there, but there was also, he was also the uh, royal physician. And I combined them into one character because he had influence over both. So even though he was a royal physician, he was controlling everything through whoever this person was who was at the head of the military. So it created them, made them both um, one person because that was easier to show that, hey, that there's some, there's some corruption here. This is kind of, this isn't right. This guy who doesn't know anything about the military 
wants to control the military. And he came in because Tenuchi liked him and he, he pleased the king. And that's how big that uh, corruption was. And it really took um, uh, Maria Carolina to like really insist on him going and kind of waiting him out. And Maria Teresa did something really wonderful where she said, okay, if, you, if there's a son, if there's an heir to the throne, then my daughter gets to be a regent. And that's a really genius of Maria Teresa. She did this with all of, uh, all of her kids. This way, her child, the females could actually get a say in the ruling of the kingdoms. And so that's why it was so important for Maria Carolina to have a son. And once she has the son, then she starts making power moves. So that's where she starts replacing people and getting people on her side. And it got to the point where Tanucci had to just go away. He had, he had to retire, and which was something just kind of fun to do. And even Ferdinand himself, he didn't like going to any of these meetings. And he showed up to one. And he just was like, you know what? My wife knows everything. Just deal with her. And got, it gets up and leaves. <laughs> and that's this guy that we're dealing with. So I, at that point, it was like, well, might as well deal with her. And what was also interesting with like the letters and stuff, which we can get to here in a little bit, it was she always signed him, signed them to hit with his name. Everything was signed under his name. All the decrees and stuff were under his name. So that she she wrote write it up, she put her opinions in there, and then she would just have him come to her office every day and just sign them one after another. He didn't really care what he was signing; he just knew that he needed to sign it. But they kind of came together over the fact that they had this shared love of the city. Yeah, and you know, I, I kind of have affection for Ferdinand in general because you know I, I wouldn't call him a feminist. But at the same time, he really was like, I'm cool. You can run things. <laughs> Let me, if I can go back to hunting, I trust you. And I, I mean, <laughs> considering the time, that was actually a rather progressive <laughs> viewpoint <laughs> as a man. It didn't always work it. out in his, in his favor because he would just trust whoever it was that was around. Because uh, there was one point she would, if she got upset with him over something, she would just pick up and go to another palace. And he would come back, he'd grovel and come back to her, give her a present, and then she'd go back. But um, at one point she left and another noble woman comes in and she starts influencing him. And then she came back, she's like, no, 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 we're not having any of this. <laughs> and so he kind of, he was very easily influenced, mm -hmm. which kind of helps to his, you know, the feminist side where he's just able to sit back and be like, you know, I'm going to let her take care of it all. Now, because she's, so first of all, she comes, she's 16. Mm -hmm. She has 16 children. Seven. She has 17. Maria Teresa had 16. She had to outdo her mother and have 17. She had 17 children. So she's pregnant for like most of her life. <laughs> yes. And she's seen sort of in history as kind of a B word, right? She's like not necessarily viewed very favorably. Um, because she's really having to do so much of the hard work, right? Mm -hmm. She's having to make all the hard decisions. She's doing everything behind the scenes. So I'm wondering if, if you could point out, because I'm assuming most people here haven't read the book yet, um, some of the innovations or major, I don't know, how did she leave her mark? Yes. Oh my gosh. There's so much in that, like, that I had problems with, because they talk about her being oversexed. They say uh, that Maria Carolina was oversexed. And I'm sorry, let's also go back and think about the fact that they didn't have birth control. They didn't have abortion. They, she couldn't tell her husband no. She was a queen and to tell her husband no was tantamount to treason. So she had no choice and just she just kept getting pregnant over and over and over again. But even still, it didn't stop her from doing all of these things. So some of the more basic ones where uh, she finishes a lot of the projects. So she does a lot, like I mentioned with Caserta and then the Jesuits, they got into a whole heap of trouble. There's a whole history with that and they all got pushed out, but there were all these buildings and stuff just left abandoned. And so she started turning those into universities and hospitals 
and you know places to do good for the community uh, she regulated the coral fisheries one big one uh, you and i recently discussed was the fact that they would actually and you can fill me in on this because this is something i'm not too familiar with they would bury the bodies of the dead underneath the churches correct yes yeah so in southern italy up until 1806 or something it is you'll mm -hmm. tell you'll, you'll fill me in on the day in a moment yeah bodies used to just be buried just used to be placed underneath the church and they used to just leave the full body there was no sort of preservation or wrapping or anything um so underneath every italian church <laughs> <laughs> it's just a mountain of skeletons, just a mountain of bones. But then, but then, uh, she started uh, getting the people to actually bury the bodies in, like, properly, like in the grounds, sarcophaguses, that sort of thing. And she was, when she was doing it, she was getting the money from the nobility to do this to incentivize the common people to do it, but the nobility was still doing it themselves anyways. They ignored it until um, Murat comes in and he's just a whole other uh, ball of uh, fun to get into when it came to Italy. And he started forcing it to happen. So he gets all the credit for it. Whereas- and Murat is Napoleon's brother-in-law who was effectively the king of Southern Italy for a short yes. period of time. But- um, yeah, I mean, and, but what it is, is it's like a major scientific innovation. I mean, it sounds like basic now, but the control and spread of disease and bacteria. Is, yeah, she you know, was I mean, so involved with that. She also got involved in uh, getting the people to have dried pasta. That was a thing, because we always think of, you know, when you go on the television, they're like, oh, this is the way the ancestors used to make it in, in Italy. Well, that, sure, if you were in the countryside, but in the city, to do that there were, there's big rat problems and it would affect you know your being able to eat so she was able to get a system going to get dried pasta into the people to help feed the people and control disease which was a whole fun i have a friend who was a micro health micro or a microbiologist involved in public health she has this whole long specific name that basically deals with infectious diseases. And we had this discussion over dinner one night about rats and what they can do to your pasta, which we will not get into, but it's quite enlightening. <laughs> and so that was something she was very involved with. And But my favorite part, the favorite thing that she did for me were um, olive trees. We all, well, that's just one of, another thing that we think of in southern Italy, especially in the area around Naples, is the olive trees. And when she was there, there were these vast uh, swatches of land that was called wastelands. And that was because of Mount Vesuvius, which during her time, during the 18th century, it erupted six times. Mm -hmm. And they were violent eruptions. So, I mean, you it's been dormant since 1943, if I'm correct yeah. on the date there. And so to think about how many times this volcano erupted and how much it let all the stuff, the toxins that they left out. And the toxins were talking like there was a uh, fluorine and then there's these, um, add a, oh, I'm forgetting what it is, uh, the name lots for it is. Lots of guesses. <laughs> yeah, lots of guesses, it's a tephra. So tephra, it kind of has this like glass kind of substance and kind of makes the soil feel like, sand and the fluorine is actually bad for plants and there was nothing that they could do to plant it the romans had tried at one point and the romans couldn't even get something planted in there and so there was a physician who was also that she gets into her place or other physician uh domenico and he was very big into plants and he studied um, botany in uh, France. And they, she talked to him about a possibility of getting something to plant, something that would help the country to feed the people, to give them a good export. Because the only export at the time that they really had was uh, sulfur, which um, that day they were calling it brimstone. And the export of that, the mining of that at the time was really, really bad. And so she wanted something more sustainable. And so they started looking at um, different plants and the one that was the best they determined was olive trees. And the reason for it is that olive trees, they can 
they can be drought resistant and they don't have really deep roots. So it takes really deep roots to get and thick roots to get through all of that tephra and the bad stuff to get down to a good soil. And that's, you know, that nice you know, soil, the volcanic soil that we like to, to think of, of Italy having this wonderful volcanic soil for, you know, growing. And that hadn't had an opportunity to develop yet. But if you had enough um, water go through, it would help to break down andesols, that's the word, andesols in the soil. And it would break down all of these andesols and you could have these, you know, built this nice, these nice trees that would also withstand a drought. And so that's when all of these, they started planting all of these trees and started doing that for the people. And so it was really on the edge of science when they started doing it because there were things like, in that time period, there was so much science developing. You know, with enlightenment, it wasn't just uh, philosophy and governing, it was also science. You had inoculations and which is the precursor to vaccines starting to come up. And then you have this, the studies of volcanoes happening. They started studying um, the volcano in Hawaii at that time. And, I, and then also the um, Naples and others and just really getting to the science, um, oxygen was something that was still a theory in the 18th century. Then they didn't know what was causing rust and why things were happening. And oxygen was just a theory. And, and it wasn't even on the periodic table, which I don't even think the periodic table was really a thing. I may be mistaken on that. I'm not a scientist, um, but it might not have even, it was still not quite a thing yet. And so it was, she was really at the forefront of so much. Yeah, this is such a, an interesting period. It's really like a, it's a period of globalization, really. Mm -hmm. Because you have the American colonies, you've got the American Revolution in 1776, you've got the French Revolution in 1793. Then you have the Neapolitan Revolution, which Maria Carolina has to negotiate in 1799. We could talk about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, Pompeii is discovered just a few years before she comes to the throne, this brings an international crowd of tourists, of very wealthy, you know, high elite tourists coming through southern Italy. The neoclassical post offices in the United States are a direct result of Pompeii fever, of people going to the kingdom of the two Sicilies, seeing these classical ruins revealed to the world for the first time in 2000 years, and then running with that in, in you know, <laughs> in art, in poetry, and literature throughout the world. So um, yes, the study of science, be as we define science today, really begins in the Enlightenment. Before that, medicine was a, you know, curses Legion. from God and bad luck. And, you know, all of, all of, it was, a, it was a world that was much more about uh, truths versus that, versus facts. Mm -hmm. And she's right at the very beginning. And it's interesting to think that as we have this moment where there's so much a new intellect being born across the world, the woman at the helm of the person at the helm of one of the most important centers was a woman. Yes. And she doesn't get the credit. She, uh, the same people who were, you know, just talking terrible about Marie Antoinette. And we, once we get into the French Revolution, we can bring more of this in. They go from the French Revolution to Naples and they start talking that trash on Maria Carolina. And so, so yeah, let's talk about that. And I just want to read the comment that's in the chat from Joe that's really fantastic. She says, I find it interesting that we know a lot about Marie Antoinette who is often port portrayed as frivolous, materialistic and immature. But her sister who would be described as competent, mature and intelligent is more relegated to history's shadows. Mm -hmm. So even today, really, we can say that the slander continues, right? Oh, absolutely. It totally does. I think even in some of the books that I read about Marie Antoinette, they, they slant, continued the slander. About, slander Maria Carolina. Yeah, about Maria Carolina. I was like, wait, you're one hand, you're saying these things weren't true and the slander is towards Marie Antoinette, but yet you're, you're not defending her own sister. And it was something that really frustrated me in, in researching the book. And I think for me, if I want to go out on a limb, I think a lot of these women that go to the forefront that we have a tendency to remember are the women who were considered frivolous, who were considered to be naughty per se, where they were 
doing murders. And for the longest time, those are the women that kind of had a tendency to stick out, even though there's this rich history of women all over the world that were doing these phenomenal things. So that's just me getting off my soapbox right now. <laughs> so, so let's let's turn the conversation towards what you consider like the major turning point of all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know how. Okay. <laughs> um, so we have the, as I said before, the the, the French Revolution and then the Neapolitan Revolution mm-hmm. in 1799. So in Naples, as in Paris, well, in speak specifically about the Kingdom of Naples, there's a huge in, French influence. There's a, a very well-developed court in Naples and at Caserta of poets and scholars, um, very deep intellectual tradition. It's a very international court, but it's really infused with French ideals, ideas and ideals, mm-hmm. and the ideals being political ones. And they are really planting the seeds of revolution. Mm-hmm. Now, Maria Carolina and Ferdinand in particular actually had some very progressive ideas. They were actually working on a, a, a workers' colony that was going to be a utopia where everybody was equal, men and women were equal, and nobody owned land, it belonged to everybody. But everything changed. Everything changes when Marie Antoinette is killed at the guillotine. Yeah. So yes. tell us about <laughs> what happened. Yes. So it was interesting. So she really kind of played with the whole enlightenment uh, stuff and, and history and the philosophy. And she really uh, engrossed that. They were also the Freemasons that were coming around at the time. And they were getting kicked out of lots of different places, uh, France included. And so she was, she read a lot of their works and she brought them, she let them come to Italy. But when the French Revolution happened, it really kind of, you know, brought those ideas. You couldn't have a monarchy, a traditionalist monarchy that really believed that you were ordained by God to be a ruler and have these enlightened ideas. They really just didn't work. And Unfortunately, she didn't really see that because she was not raised that way, but she still had a lot of these ideas. And the French Revolution itself was really interesting when it started to spread into Italy. And this was one of the things that really uh, took me about this time period was that once the French Revolution happened and you have Napoleon coming in and then you have these people talking about it in Italy, France had a huge influence on trying to get in there. And it wasn't so much, I think, from France's viewpoint. It may have been different from the people's viewpoint of wanting to have this democracy and a constitution. And I think for France, it was a matter of being able to to get into this country that had a lot of wealth and taking as much as they could because France was broke. There was, there was a lot of financial problems that happened with France, even when her sister was in power, that and even before she was in power, the nobility, they weren't paying taxes, so they didn't have any money coming in, and they had a lot of, and they accumulated, accumulated a lot of wealth, and so the people, you know, they didn't have anything, and then they go and they fund the American Revolution, and we owed them millions of dollars, and which is... It was like, I want to say it was a good, it was like at least a couple million, which by that standard, that was a lot, a significant amount of money that really bankrupted the country. And they wanted what Maria Carolina had in the kingdom of the two Sicilies. They really had their eye on that. And so it was, it was such a hard place for her to maneuver as I think as a person that was hard to do. And then you had people that she trusted turning towards uh, the revolution. You had um, Medici, she had a, of course there's a Medici in her court, there's a Medici everywhere in Italy (laughs) and in all the important events. And he was there and he turned on her. Um, I know one of your favorite people in history, Eleonora, she turned on her, Domenico as well, her trusted physician and scientist who knew her, who knew about the works that she did, he turned on her as well. And he was actually involved in some of the slander about her. And it was such a terrible place for her to be in that she actually turned away from those enlightenment ideas because they burned her and they hurt her so much. And they murdered her sister. And they murdered her sister, which is the other thing with that. It was such an affront that they murdered 
a king queen. It's just, I don't, it wasn't something that was really common during that time period. Yeah. And her sister was so close to her. And unfortunately, you know, they had, they had letters and, you know, they wrote back and forth and they had, you know, gifts and things. And it was, she kept trying to get her sister to come to her in front and in Naples. And when she was killed, it was just so just heartbreaking for her. And that's when she vowed revenge on France. And at all costs, she was going to uh, take out France. Yeah, just, she didn't care what happened to it. She wanted it gone. And it was, it was very detrimental, I think, to the country. I think she kind of egged things on. Uh, at one point, she uh, didn't allow the language of uh, French the French language to be spoken at all at court. And I think it, go, it went out towards like everywhere else. She didn't want to hear it. It was banned. These artists that were coming in that were French, she would expel them. And only if they came back and said, you know, they vowed their love of, um, you know, to Maria Car Carolina, would she forgive them and let them stay? But she was just, she was just done with them. And there was one point, there was a ambassador from France that came. She wouldn't recognize him as an ambassador because she was like, they're not a country. They don't have a king and queen anymore. And he came during the period where she wasn't speaking French and he only spoke French. And so she pretended like she didn't know, understand what he was saying. Mm. And she actually did that to him and because she was just so upset. It really, I think that point that it didn't just change history it changed I think her on a level when you look at the history and you look at the change for going from this woman who was very much a woman uh, who was about these you know scientific advances and enlightened ideas and turning and wanting to just destroy anything that was French yeah and it, you know just as a, a, a fun small example of French influence in, in Naples at the time you think of the classic pastry the sfogliatella that buttery flaky pastry on the outside that was from the French chefs who were at court they took mm -hmm. sort of a local pastry and they Frenchified it by wrapping it in flaky pastry <laughs> so yeah the chefs the fashion there was an entire colony of silk weavers that was were imported from France I and mean, this is a deeply international place there's a ton of French influence and she really, there. I mean, there's this distinct mark that you can see in the timeline of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies where things are very open. The doors internationally, intellectually, culturally are wide open and then Marie Antoinette dies and they slam shut. Mm -hmm. And one of her biggest, most successful weapons was propaganda because people in the countryside of Southern Italy were not so international. These people like, my ancestors and your ancestors, we've been living in the same small town in the hills <laughs> for 2,000 years. We're not eating spoliatel. <laughs> um, and she was really able to, to spread the propaganda there that the French are coming to um, destroy your culture and, and ruin what you have. Mm -hmm. And it was actually very successful. And it was the people in the countryside who wound up helping to support the monarchy ultimately. Mm -hmm. the, the American Revolution, the French Revolution succeeded, the Neapolitan Revolution did not. The no. It was restored. So I, so I wanted to leave some time for questions. We're already at 8.50. This is just time is flying yeah. by. So let me um, open this up. If you want to put a question in the chat, I'll read it, or you can just go ahead and unmute yourself. I read somewhere, and I may have gotten my peep by kings and queens mixed up, but that Mary, Maria Carolina or Naples actually had more money than some of the other kingdoms. Where did they get their money from and where did she get the money to, to build such a, a huge palace, Caserta? They had, um, they taxed heavily. She taxed nobility. They did a lot of taxing. Uh, they had, um, there was a period where they actually took the money from the Jesuits. So there was that. So she taxes and um, and the Jesuits, and there was money that had come in from Spain. So there was, they had money and it started to deplete by the time they, uh, France was starting to kick up its problems. So she was raising taxes higher and higher and higher just to fund an army to try to defend them. Okay. Yeah, and if you, if you wanna see the level of wealth there, good, good place to visit is the treasury 
of San Gennaro is so that in the cathedral, the main cathedral of Naples, there's the chapel where there's the vial of blood of San Gennaro, which miraculously liquefies every September 19th. And then there's, a, it's a museum now, but it was the treasury of all of the jewels that were donated from wealthy families in Naples to seek good favor from San Gennaro. And it is something like 30% larger than the, crown, the collection of the crown jewels of London. So once again, we got a palace bigger than Versailles, more jewels than London. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like there needs to be a mic drop there. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Who else has a question? Who died first, her or Ferdinand? And how did it impact the line of succession? Um, so that's interesting. Uh, so after they get, they flee the first time, uh, her and Ferdinand actually break up. They, they were separated. He had enough of her and her, her schemes. Cause she was always, that's the kind of person she was. She always had a scheme. She always had a plan. And he was just kind of like, I'm done with all of this. He was very upset. He blamed her for losing the kingdom and they stayed separated. And he actually had this little, um, theater girl which at the time the theater women were basically prostitutes for the most part and so the royal family did not like that but they're like oh we'll keep them on and that's when uh her son started really taking over so she actually died first she died in um she was 53 years old and she died in austria she was in austria when uh they were trying to get restore the uh, kingdom back to her family, to her line, because uh, Jean Marat, of course, had to try to, he was trying to lay claim to the royal line. And so she was, she had to fight for Naples to stay with her family. And so she died first, and then Ferdinand died later. And by, but by that time, her son, um, Francis or Francesco, he's the one who, is already taken over. He's already doing what she did with her with her husband and ruling the kingdom. So it didn't really effectively, affect it too much. Then the, effectively though, the Napoleonic invasions sort of really dilute the power of the kingdom. And then eventually not a couple decades later, we have the modern nation of Italy as we know mm -hmm. it today. So in a way, she's not technically the end of that kingship, uh, kingdom, but- yeah. There's like, yeah. there's like, power there's like she three, three or four kings after her. Yeah, there. I feel like they were more. They weren't so useful. No, no. <laughs> the power that she had. Yeah. <laughs> so we said that we were, and we can continue to ask. Um, you, you can continue to ask more questions, but we also said we were going to give away five yes. signed copies of the book, and you have some trivia questions. I do, and these are some of the things. Um, We've pretty much said almost all of these during at one point during the, our talk. Um, so who can tell me how many children, we'll start off with a nice easy one. How many children Maria Carolina had? 17. Okay. Who said that? Oh, Christina. I want to have Christina pop in on here that, at the same time. I just got my copy. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> unmute, Scusa. <laughs> all right so well let's uh suzanne we'll let her have it i'll let you write down you can get me uh the addresses then Carolina. So, no, or if you do, yeah if you can put your email address into the chat box so i can capture it mm -hmm. and then i'll send you an email so we can get your home address okay yes. and then oh i'm so glad christina that you got a copy today it's wonderful thank you um all right when did they break ground on caserta I love these games. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, Christina just got her set, her, so I know she knows it. <laughs> All right, Helen, yeah, 1752. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, you could definitely play. How about some of our other, uh, other people get books? Um, now, we didn't really talk about this too much. Now, there were two palaces. There's the Grand um, Caserta, which she's, they stayed at 
most of the time. I, 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 and I like to keep it there because it was such a wonderful place to write about. I had to write about it myself. So I kept her there the vast majority of the time. But there is another palace that was there prior to um, her coming in. This was where Carlos lived while Caserta was being built before he could actually live there. And it's, to give you a hint, it's in, t uh, in town by the sea. It's not really something that, I don't know if people can really visit it nowadays, but it was something that um, by this the ocean. One, this is the one that's next to Herculaneum? Yes. They actually discovered Herculaneum when they started building this palace. And then they were like, oh, I guess we got to go inland. They still built a palace there, but mm -hmm. they couldn't go really big because Herculaneum. And it wasn't really a great place to build a palace because it's right by the ocean. So if people come yeah. in, yeah, you need something further away to keep the fam royal family safe. Yeah. Does anyone know where that is? It starts with a P. I don't Any think we mentioned it in this talk. Huh? I don't think we, did we mention it? At any I don't think, well, no, I don't think we mentioned it. Not okay, it's a very good guess. Not pay. All right, we might need to skip that one. Okay, we'll skip that one. Um, so we mentioned this one. How many times did Vesuvius erupt in the 18th century? <laughs> I feel like I'm doing a pop quiz. <laughs> Christina, you get like all the stars. <laughs> Sorry. So for those of you who uh, want, who are uh, open up the chat box, yeah, Stephanie. Okay. Yeah, six times. So six times, and that was a lot. Like when I was, ta I was talking with a, um, a volcanologist from Cal State Fullerton, who her specialty was not only with volcanoes, but she uh, worked a lot with uh, the volcano in Yellowstone. And she was ah. like, how? Six is a lot. That is a lot of uh, times for eruption. Uh, so just imagine all of that going on. Um, all right. So the last one I have here is name something besides olives that Charlotte did for the people. And we talked about this a lot. So you can throw... Oh, Joe, yeah, coffee. There you go. <laughs> Joe, just uh, text me your, um, in the chat box, just give me your email address so that I, we can send you, I can send you an email asking for your snail mail address. All right, so I skipped, so the one we skipped, I'll let you go ahead and if you have a, a good one. If you have a good yeah, if you have another question that we could throw out there, another no. one that we could do. Um, I didn't think so, God. And I used to teach, you know, I'm a teacher. I should be able to come up with test questions on the spot, but I'm feeling frozen right now. <laughs> oh, I got one. I got one. All right. So you mentioned that there is a huge, that she started the industry for dried pasta. Mm -hmm. It was a big, big deal. The city of Gragnano was and is, continues to be today, a major center for dried pasta. Really? Um, and and I forgot the I see this is why I just out <laughs> myself. I was like, I started explaining it and I lost my train of, I just nerded out my own self. I actually answered my own question. I was going to say, what's the city? It's Graniano. Okay, you come up with another, I'm not coming up with another question. I'm um, myself. Uh, let me see here. So oh, I, will add I, got to that. I got it. There's two other um, duchies where she had, or three other duchies where she had family in the north name one of them oh that's a good one one of them is famous for cheese yes <laughs> one of them has a wonderful wine you know it for its wine everybody likes to travel there there's a movie where it was pharma there we go pharma. Carolyn. yeah yeah <laughs> we got and there we go and then the palace's name was portici that was the other palace. So yeah, I'll just finish my ridiculous pasta comment, but Gragnano pasta, I bet it was in Gragnano this summer, mm -hmm. where they, the reason they dry pasta there was because the proximity to the water with the volcano in the background creates this perfect wind where you get mm -hmm. no humidity and it dries the pasta perfectly. And that was the center of pasta making until World War II, obviously got paused and destroyed. Mm -hmm. And then when they restarted, 
the factories in Northern Italy, namely Barilla, had way more money because they mm -hmm. were far less devastated than Southern Italy. And what happened was people in Southern Italy wound up borrowing money from the nascent mafia to try to compete with the giant factories and couldn't do it. And that's how that area got all filled up with mafia. Wow. So buy Gragnano pasta, folks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Carolyn, just give me your uh, email address and I'll put that into the email to Diana. Are there any more questions before we say good night this evening? All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, Diana. This was super fun. Congratulations on the book. Thank you and thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. I really enjoyed it as well. Awesome. All right, everyone, have a wonderful evening. And uh, if you'd like so, more of these, send me an email and let me know what topics you're interested in. I definitely want to do more. And I'm very happy to be responsive to your questions. So have a good night. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.